There are fast-moving developments in Ukraine. Overnight, it appears the country's ousted president is now in Russia. To what America is officially calling a Russian invasion of Ukraine. Government forces continue to prepare their defenses outside the key city of Mariupol. Russia has deliberately and repeatedly violated the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine. It's a deeply serious situation. We have to show real resolve, real resilience in demonstrating to Russia that if she carries on in this way, the relationship between Europe and Russia, Britain and Russia, America and Russia will be radically different in the future. The next post-Soviet conflict to cover has been arguably the most high profile in recent years, the ongoing struggle for Eastern Ukraine. The story once again starts several decades prior to the modern day conflict. Ukraine had been part of the Russian Empire since the 18th century and declared independence following the outbreak of the Russian Civil War in 1917. During this time, ethnic Russians had been settled into the region by Catherine the Great to cement Russia's claims to the region. Following the country's independence, the Bolshevik Red Army later took control of Ukraine and merged it into the Soviet Union in 1922. In 1932, Joseph Stalin carried out an attempt to ethnically cleanse the region of Ukrainians, which saw the death of what is conservatively estimated to be between 3 and 7.5 and million people. Ukraine was also a major front line in the Soviet Union's war with Nazi Germany, which saw many millions more killed. After Stalin's death, the new General Secretary Nikita Khrushchev transferred the Crimean Peninsula from Russia to Ukraine, despite the region having a large population of Russians. After the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991, Russia agreed to recognize Ukraine's sovereignty over the region in 1997. Ukraine was part of the Commonwealth of Independent States, which aligned it politically and militarily with Russia, but internal struggles between pro-Western and pro-Russian politics would soon ensue. The pro-Western Yulia Tymoshenko began her second spell as Prime Minister in 2007 under Ukraine's pro-Western President Viktor Yushchenko. In the 2010 presidential election, Tymoshenko ran against the leader of the opposition and former Prime Minister Viktor Yanukovych. Following allegations of voter fraud influencing Yanukovych's victory, the election was held again and declared free and fair by international observers and confirmed the victory for Yanukovych. This election was largely viewed as another political battle in Ukraine between pro-Russian and pro-Western politics, with Tymoshenko setting her sights on Ukraine joining the EU and NATO while distancing itself from Russia, and Yanukovych favouring working with both the West and Russia but not formally joining any alliances, essentially favouring neutrality. But Ukrainians living in Western parts of the country distrusted him as they saw him as a puppet of Putin because of his first language being Russian and his lack of fluidity in the Ukrainian language. Ukraine opened proceedings for an economic and political association with the European Union in 2012, but by the end of 2013, the government suspended these proceedings and Ukraine then agreed a deal over Russian exports of natural gas. This sparked outrage amongst the Ukrainian public and protests began throughout the country, mostly in the western parts and mostly in and around Kiev. Yanukovych eventually stepped down and fled to Russia and was replaced as president by the pro-European Petro Poroshenko. The largely Russian-inhabited Autonomous Republic of Crimea declared full independence from Ukraine in March 2014, after Russia had sent in disguised troops known as Little Green Men to capture strategic areas and government buildings. The Crimean government requested that it be incorporated into Russia, which Russia immediately accepted. Putin sent troops in to consolidate Russia's new claim over Crimea's port city of Sevastopol and the Republic of Crimea itself as its 84th and 85th federal subjects respectively. Russia had a lease agreement on the warm water port that was set to end in 2017, so this was likely a factor in the decision to annex the peninsula. Later that month, separatists in the eastern oblast of Luhansk and Donetsk, collectively known as the Donbass region, declared independence separately, proclaiming the Luhansk and Donetsk People's Republics. Ukraine sent its military in to reclaim the region, but Russia propped up the Donbass rebels, which led to an all-out conflict between Ukraine and separatists. Fighting ensued until February 2015 when a peace agreement was signed in Minsk, Belarus by Ukraine, Russia and the leaders of the two breakaway republics, as well as a neutral European peacekeeping organisation. The agreement brought about a ceasefire and ordered all foreign militaries, including Russia's, to leave the Donbass. 
Sources based in Kiev have reported that none of the agreements from Minsk have been fully adhered to by either side, and the conflict has remained ongoing today. Russia has troops on its border with the Donbass and Ukraine on its border, while the Ukrainian government supplies volunteer militias in the region, even including some neo-Nazi groups. Some escalations have come up in this time, including a surface-to-air missile which brought down a Malaysian airline while flying over Donetsk, killing everyone on board. Russia held Ukraine responsible as it flew over its flight information region, while Ukraine claims that Russia supplied the rebels with the missile which was used to bring down the plane. In November of 2018, Ukraine navigated the waters between Russia and the Crimean Peninsula to access a southeastern port city from the Black Sea. Russian ships opened fire on them on the basis that they were violating Russia's maritime territory. Ukraine declared martial law for 30 days in its eastern territory, but fortunately the incident didn't escalate any further. Almost 2.5 million civilians have been displaced so far, and the death toll for this conflict currently sits around 13,000, a quarter of whom being civilians. Ukraine controls most of the territory in the Donbass now, but this doesn't include the two main cities. Poroshenko ran for president again in April 2019, but was beaten by comedian Volodymyr Zelensky, who is also pro-European and wants Ukraine to join NATO and the EU. No end is in sight for this war yet, so it remains to be seen what happens next with it. The final major conflict to cover in Europe in the post-Soviet era is the small nation of Moldova, which sits between Ukraine and Romania. The region is culturally and linguistically shaped by the historic nation of Romania. Moldova had been part of both Romania and the Ukrainian SSR. The Soviet Union annexed the Romanian part in June 1940, almost exactly a year before Romania invaded the Soviet Union as part of the Axis powers of the Second World War. This was part of Operation Barbarossa led by Nazi Germany. By October of 1944, the Soviet Union had taken control of Ukraine, Moldova and Romania and re-established the Ukrainian and Moldavian SSRs. The Soviet Union would occupy and enshrine its own governmental system into Romania until 1956 and leave behind the Romanian People's Republic which would stay allied with the Soviet Union until a successful rebellion in 1989. This afternoon the TV station showed the crumpled forms of two bodies at the foot of a bullet-ridden wall, one clearly that of Romania's former dictator. Secret agents are being unmasked and handed over to the army and in the city's largest factory, the newly won democracy is already in operation. 1989 saw all the Soviet Union's allies in Eastern Europe walk away from communism and the backlash against communism spilled into the internal Soviet republics in 1990, along with a rise in nationalism. The Soviet Union has had to respond to its own internal pressures, some economic, some ethnic. Today, the Soviets said they would re-examine the basic laws that bind their 15 republics together. It's a response to the Baltic Republics and others who say there is too much central control in Moscow. Moldova's government had made Moldovan the only official language of the country in 1989 and changed its flag to a design similar to Romania's, moves which appeared to be the proceedings for forming a union with their western neighbour. This was despite a large minority of Russians and Ukrainians living in Moldova. These groups mostly lived in a somewhat isolated part of the country between the eastern border with Ukraine and the Dniester River. This region is called Transnistria, which translates from Moldovan as beyond the river Dniester. Turkic people living in the Gagauzian region also began to seek to break away from Moldova. In 1990, both Transnistria and Gagauzia declared independence from Moldova and requested that they become separate Soviet republics, but Soviet General Secretary Gorbachev denied this in order to maintain relations with Moldova. Nonetheless, authorities in both states began to gradually gain de facto control of their respective regions and all three sides obtained Soviet weaponry that was still there after the Soviet Union was dissolved in December 1991. Soviet military personnel who happened to be Russian had remained in Transnistria and their commanding officer who was pro-Transnistrian independence acted accordingly despite being ordered to maintain a neutral peacekeeping unit. He was replaced with a more neutral commanding officer but the war that would soon ensue was unable to be stopped as the damage had already been done. Conflicts broke out along the river border between Moldova and Transnistria with Romania giving Moldova support and Russian and Ukrainian volunteers fighting for their fellow countrymen in Transnistria. Despite some invasions from either side, the river would ultimately be too much of a barrier for either state to be able to establish a clear advantage, and eventually a peace agreement was signed in July 1992. 
Today, the Russian and Soviet legacy in Transnistria is still very visible and they remain the only state in the former Soviet Union, or indeed the world, to still use its emblem on their flag and passport. Gagauzia agreed to autonomy within Moldova in 1994, effectively reversing the Declaration of Independence. Transnistria, along with Artsakh, South Ossetia and Abkhazia, is another breakaway state in the former USSR locked in a frozen conflict. We're more or less done now, but there's one final major conflict which took place in the post-Soviet era, the only war outside of Europe and the only one not being between two self-declared independent countries. It took place in Tajikistan. Tajikistan had declared its independence in October 1991 and held its first election in November. Like some other former Soviet republics and satellite states, the Communist Party which was no longer in power was still active and allowed to run in the subsequent elections like any other party. But unlike many, the Communist Party in Tajikistan actually won, with Rahman Nabiyev becoming the independent country's first president. Protests and rallies against them began all over the country, made up mostly of liberal reformers and Islamists, and eventually turned into a civil war in 1992. Nabiyev handed weapons to pro-government militias, and anti-government militias redoubled their efforts to resist them. After some exchanges of power between Nabiyev and a fellow Tajiki communist politician, Abarsho Iskandrov, Nabiyev eventually stepped down under pressure and was replaced by Emma Mali Rachmanov. This saw Tajikistan under its first non-communist regime since it had been part of the Russian Empire 75 years before. The resistance from reformists and Islamists continued despite the change, and they would go on to form the United Tajik Opposition in 1993. The war gained attention in other parts of the world, with Tajikistan receiving support from its CIS allies including Russia, while the opposition were joined by Islamic warlords, who themselves had recently ended Mohammad Najibullah's communist government in neighbouring Afghanistan. A ceasefire and subsequent negotiations between the UTO and the government occurred in 1994, and by the next year, Rachmanov and his allies were elected formally into presidential and parliamentary positions in government respectively. The ceasefire broke when fighting erupted in an anti-government area in the south of the country, but the war finally reached its closing stages in 1997. By then, an estimated 60,000 people had been killed, with 1.2 million displaced. A US, UN and Russia brokered armistice was signed, and Rachmanov pardoned all opposition leaders in exile the next year before integrating the UTO forces into the Tajik National Army. After winning the next two elections in 1999 and 2006, Rachmanov changed his surname to Rachman to sound like Russian and ordered that the same be done for registration of all babies born thereafter. Between 2010 and 2012, various factions of the UTO rose up again against the government, but these were eventually resistant enough to force them to surrender. In 2013, Rachman was elected for another seven-year term, which will keep him in power until at least 2020. His four elections have been given questionable legitimacy by international observers. The Soviet Union was arguably the most diverse country in the world during its 70-year reign over Eastern Europe, Central Asia and Siberia, which ultimately would be its downfall, and would make the legacy of its collapse so significant. With various factors like Russian being the only official language, single-party rule across the country, national identity suppressed along with mass atrocities being committed against its people on a mass scale, as well as depleting the country's wealth on nuclear arms and space races, the regime of the large diverse land was always going to have a hard time staying together. The nationalist rise in the republics that resulted from 70 years of this suppression would eventually lead to their independence, but at a massive cost. It also led to ethnic cleansing, constitutional crises and prolonged wars, which would kill and displace millions. Russia has filled the void as the new rival of the West, which is clear not just from their involvement in Georgia and Ukraine, but also later in Bosnia, Kosovo and more recently in Syria. Russia was set up as a democracy, but independent observers across the board have reported Russia's freedom and democracy ratings to be incredibly low, mostly due to the country's lack of freedom of speech and discrimination against LGBT groups. Russia's President Vladimir Putin has been de facto in charge since 2000, but this four-year spell between 2008 and 2012 seeing his ally Dmitry Medvedev serve as president. Putin was then re-elected in 2012 and 2018 and is set to serve until 2024. The legitimacy of both these elections is greatly disputed. Many former Soviet states are still aligned with Russia, but many others have turned to align themselves with the West due to these political circumstances. 
many of the conflicts that have taken place in the post-Soviet era are still unsettled, with the region still being affected by corruption, poverty, dictators and militaristic regimes, as well as constantly high tensions and occasional violence still going on in the so-called frozen conflict zones. The situation in these parts of the former Soviet Union is a stark reminder that when we tolerate authoritarianism in the name of the collective over the individual, we may not just stand to suffer the consequences in the short term, but also the precedent and legacies that follow, which can be so long-standing and so far-reaching.